Hello and welcome to this presentation on fetal arrhythmias, a focus on prenatal ultrasound assessment. My name is Lindsay Seeger and I am one of the sonographer coordinators for the fetal heart program in the Center for Advanced Fetal Care at the University of Maryland Medical Center. This presentation was prepared with Jamie Meck, our other fetal heart program sonographer coordinator, and Dr. Shifa Turan, the director of the fetal heart program at the University of Maryland Medical Center. This is a two-part presentation. Part one, presented by Jamie, covered normal and ectopic rhythms. And in part two, we will focus on assessing fetal tachycardia and bradycardia. As a quick review from part one, this is a basic outline of the images to obtain when assessing fetal arrhythmias. Of course, it is important to obtain all images of a complete fetal echo protocol. Next, we wanted to emphasize the importance of the umbilical artery Doppler. Although we assess umbilical artery on all fetuses, it is important to pay close attention in the case of arrhythmias because overall ventricular rate is important to management and prognosis. We also want to obtain an M-mode image, clearly showing atrial and ventricular contractions. We want to get an inflow and outflow image by placing the Doppler gate over the mitral and aortic valves. And we also want to obtain a parallel artery and vein image. Then we want to measure certain intervals on at least two of these modalities. Those intervals are A to A, or the atrial rate, V to V, or the ventricular rate, and then also assessing the relationship between the atria and ventricles with our AV interval measured from the beginning of atrial contraction to the beginning of ventricular contraction, and your VA interval, which is measured from the beginning of ventricular contraction to the beginning of atrial contraction. And I mentioned we like to do this on two different modalities. Typically, we like to see these intervals measured on the M-mode image and one of the Doppler images obtained. Here is just a quick example of the normal M-mode and inflow-outflow images with measurements of the AV and VA intervals measured. I think it's good to point out that these images were taken on the same fetus and you can see that the intervals are measured and you're getting similar measurements on both images. And when we can reproduce an image, we can really prove that we have properly assessed the fetal heart rhythm. Here are your options for parallel artery and vein assessment. You have your pulmonary artery and vein, your transverse aorta and innominate vein. On fetuses with an interrupted IVC, you can obtain the aorta and azygous vein. And in babies that are in a tough position or a little bit further along, we can even use our renal artery and vein to assess these intervals. So as I mentioned, our part one of the presentation covered normal and ectopic rhythms. So today in this part of the presentation, we are going to focus on tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias. So first, tachycardia. In this category, we have sinus tachycardia. We have atrial flutter which actually um, falls into the category of SVT or supraventricular tachycardia. And we'll look at a couple different types of SVT and also ventricular tachycardia. These account for about 15% of fetal arrhythmias. So tachycardia is defined as fetal heart rate greater than 180 beats per minute. It can be transient or sustained and sustained tachycardia may cause heart failure high drops, or even something called mirror syndrome, which is a combination of fetal high drops and maternal preeclampsia. So in order to talk about the different types of tachycardia, I think it's easiest to break them down and look at the mechanisms that cause the arrhythmia or the way in which they work. So these are the different mechanisms we'll look at. The accelerated conduction, which is your sinus tachycardia, our re-entry tachycardias, which are atrial flutter, atrioventricular reentry tachycardia, or AVRT, 
and persistent junctional reciprocating tachycardia, which is PJRT. We also have abnormal rhythm generation, which is atrial ectopic tachycardia, junctional ectopic tachycardia, and ventricular ectopic tachycardia. And lastly, we have our triggered activity, which is torsade de puens. And we're not going to visit um, this so much in the tachycardia portion, but we will come back to it when we discuss long QT syndrome later in the presentation. I also want to point out that the italicized arrhythmias do fall into the SVT category or supraventricular tachycardia category. Your AVRT is your most common type of SVT and atrial flutter is the second most common type of SVT. So the majority of the time during this discussion we'll focus on those reentry tachycardias since they are most common. But first, let's go ahead and take a look at our accelerated conduction mechanism, which is tachycardia. So in sinus tachycardia, you have fetal heart rate greater than 180 beats per minute, but usually remains less than 220 beats per minute. It is sustained, and again, the mechanism is that the electrical impulses are still moving through the normal conduction pathway, just at an increased rate. So that means that you still have your one-to-one -one conduction and you still have the normal relationship of the AV interval shorter than the VA interval. And here's a clip showing an example of a baby, of a baby with a sinus tachycardia. It can be associated with infection, maternal medication, obstetrical hemorrhage, maternal hyperthyroid, and fetal anemia. To take a look at the M mode and inflow outflow images here, um, we're going to go ahead and start with the M mode. So, just to orient you, this heart is apex up. So, first we are cutting through the ventricles at the top, denoted by the arrows at the top of the M mode image, and then the atria down at the bottom, denoted by the arrows down at the bottom there. In order to measure the AV and VA interval, we're going to start with the beginning of an atrial contraction, and I've just picked the one denoted by this orange arrow here. And we're going to measure to the beginning of the, vent the following ventricular contraction, which is denoted by the orange arrow up at the top. And then for the VA interval, we're going to measure from that ventricular contraction pointed to by the orange arrow to the following atrial contraction um, seen by that yellow arrow down at the bottom. Over on the inflow outflow image, we can get those same measurements. In this example, I think it's also good to point out that the E and A wave of the mitral valve are fused in this image, which can happen with fast heart rates. Um, so to the best of our ability, we're trying to measure still from the beginning of the atrial contraction which is denoted by the orange arrow at the top, to the beginning of the ventricular contraction, denoted by the orange arrow at the bottom, and then from that ventricular contraction back to the beginning of the following atrial contraction, again denoted by the yellow arrow at the top. It's also important to know that when you do have a fused ENA wave, that this can um, alter the measurements slightly since it is difficult to determine where to place that first caliper, which is when it can be very helpful to also be comfortable gaining these measurements on the M mode image. But it still does give us a good look at the relationship between the intervals, both examples showing that the AV interval is shorter than the VA interval in sinus tachycardia. Okay, so now moving on to our reentry tachycardias, which have an accessory pathway. These tachycardias have a sudden onset and offset, so they happen very quickly, they come on quickly, and they end quickly as well. So in our reentry category, as we've said, we have atrial flutter, which has an accessory pathway within the atria. So you basically have this accessory pathway which loops the signal in the atria, causing a quick atrial rate. 
Then in atrioventricular reentry tachycardia and in persistent junctional reciprocating tachycardia, you have an accessory pathway from the ventricles to the atria. The difference between the two is that in AVRT, you have a fast conducting accessory pathway, whereas in PJRT, you have a slow conducting accessory pathway, and we'll see the difference that that makes on the ultrasound images here shortly. But let's take a quick look at atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is the second most common type of SVT. It is most often seen as two to one conduction with two atrial contractions to every one ventricular contraction. However, this is not always the case, but what is always the case is that there are more atrial contractions than ventricular contractions. The atrial rate is typically between 300 and 500 beats per minute. And if you do in fact have that two to one conduction, of course that means that the ventricular rate would be half of the atrial rate. And these are usually so seen in short episodes. Here is an image of the umbilical artery in a fetus that has atrial flutter. And I just wanted to quickly touch on this and point out that the atrial flutter waves are not fully um, filling the ventricles. So in the umbilical artery, you can see that you lose peak systolic flow um, in the umbilical artery because of those flutter waves. Even though it still reflects the ventricular rate, you can see that um, caused by the flutter waves in the atria. This is more commonly seen in the third trimester because the rate atrium increases in size as the baby grows. And 70% of fetuses that have atrial flutter also have an accessory pathway between the atria and ventricles. So you may see um, the heart rate alternating between atrial flutter and AVRT. Here's an example of atrial flutter here. You can see the atria appear to be almost just vibrating because they're contracting so quickly. And then the ventricles um, have a little bit more distinct contraction, even though they are also contracting quicker than usual. This can be associated with myocarditis, immune medications, or congenital heart defects, such as Epstein's anomaly. And I do believe the fetus in the clip did have a mild Epstein's anomaly. Looking at some other atrial flutter images, starting with the M mode down here at the bottom, we have apex down in this image. So the M mode line is cutting through the atria up at the top and the ventricular um, wall down at the bottom. And you can see in this scenario that there is a two to one conduction system or a two to one conduction. So we have the atria contracting twice to every one ventricular contraction. And that is reflected in the measurement of the atrial rate, which is about 500, and the ventricular rate, which is about 250. Up at the top, you can see an example of parallel artery and vein with the aorta and SVC. The arrows are denoting reversed flow in the SVC during atrial contraction. And this is an example that is not two to one conduction, but you can clearly see that the atrial rate is faster than the ventricular rate. Down at the bottom here, just an image of the inflow outflow in a fetus with atrial flutter. You can see that the atria are contracting very quickly and you can see the transition out of atrial flutter back into normal sinus rhythm. Um, on this image as well. Moving on to atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. This is the most common type of SVT. And as we mentioned, there is a fast conducting accessory pathway. So what does that actually mean? So if we look at the image up in the right hand corner, um, we just have a little cartoon of, of explaining the accessory pathway. So you get a signal that comes from the SA node and starts to move through the normal conduction system. 
When it gets to the end of the conduction system, you have a quick pathway that takes the signal or the electrical impulse back to the atria and creates this loop of the electrical signal. There is one-to-one -one conduction because each atrial contraction relies on the previous ventricular contraction. Fetal heart rates are typically 220 to 300 beats per minute and AVRT is usually seen in intermittent episodes. AVRT is a short VA tachycardia, which means it has a short VA interval compared to the AV interval. And that is because with this fast conducting accessory pathway, the electrical impulse is able to go from the ventricle through that pathway and back to the atria faster than it is able to go from the atria through the AV node to get back to the ventricles. And we'll see what that looks like on ultrasound as well. This is just an umbilical artery showing the overall rate of 286 beats per minute. And here is an example of a fetus with AVRT. AVRT can be associated with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, which um, just has a even more specialized accessory pathway that can send ele electrical signals in both directions. And it can also be associated with congenital heart defects. So looking closer at some other images of AVRT, in this M mode image, I just wanna orient to you first. The apex is down in this image, so we're cutting through the atrial wall first, and then the ventricular wall down closer to the bottom of the image. So also to point out, um, we did mention that you can alternate between AVRT and atrial flutter um, in certain fetuses, and this is an example of that as well. But just to point out the measurements of the AV and VA interval first, as we said, the arrows up at the top of the M mode um, are pointing to the atrial contractions. So we are going to measure from the beginning of one atrial contraction to the beginning of the following ventricular contraction there. So there's our AV interval. And then for our VA interval, we're gonna use the beginning of that ventricular contraction to the beginning of the following atrial contraction. And here you can clearly see that the AV interval is longer than the VA interval. And this is um, typical for AVRT. You can also clearly see that on this parallel artery and vein image. So this is the pulmonary vein, which is outlined in red, and you can see flow reversal below the baseline during atrial contraction. And then the pulmonary artery is outlined in that bright orange. And you can clearly see that from the ventricular contraction to the atrial contraction is much shorter than from the atrial contraction to the ventricular. And that is measured there with the yellow calipers as well. Down here at the bottom, we have an inflow outflow image. I found that with these faster heart rates, sometimes the amount of movement um, in the inflow outflow image can make it a little tough to get a clear signal again which um, is important to then feel comfortable getting these measurements in the M mode modality as well but just to point out here you can still obtain these measurements so the light blue arrow is our E wave the dark blue I'm sorry um, star is our A wave and then the orange star at the bottom is the ventricular outflow and just gonna outline those in a couple more cardiac cycles here. So again, the light blue star, E wave, dark blue is your A wave, orange is your outflow. If we measure from the beginning of the atrial contraction to the beginning of the ventricular contraction, we see our e AV interval. And then from the beginning of the ventricular to the beginning of the atria, we see our VA interval, and again, short VA compared to our AV interval. So moving on to persistent junctional reciprocating tachycardia, or PJRT. This is a more rare form of SVT, 
and it has a slow conducting accessory pathway. So again, just to outline that with our cartoon image up in the corner, still you get your signal moving through the normal pathway, and then the accessory pathway takes the signal slowly back from the ventricle to the atria. Now this still happens more quickly than the time it takes for the SA node to send out a new signal, but it is slower than in the case of a VRT. There's still one-to-one -one conduction because again, the atrial contraction is reliant on the previous ventricular contraction. Fetal heart rates are typically 180 to 220 beats per minute, and they're more commonly persistent because the heart is able to sustain this slower rate compared to the quicker rates seen in AVRT. And in this case, we get a long VA interval in relation to our AV interval. And again, that's because of this slow conducting accessory pathway. So here is a clip showing a baby that was diagnosed with PJRT. And I also want to point out that this um, can be difficult to differentiate or almost impossible to differentiate um, in fetal life from sinus tachycardia. So if we have a fetus that falls into this category with a one-to-one -one conduction, heart rate greater than 180 with a longer VA interval than a V interval, First, we should consider sinus tachycardia and rule out some of the causes that we know for sinus tachycardia. And if all of those have been excluded, then we should consider PJRT in our differential diagnosis. Let's look at some more images of PJRT. These intervals or measurements of these intervals are obtained the same way as we discussed previously on the other um, arrhythmias, so I'm not going to point out exactly those measurements again, but I do want to point out here on this M-mode image, you can still clearly see that there is one-to-one -one conduction. And then on this inflow outflow image down at the bottom, your AV and VA intervals measured, you can see that the AV interval is shorter than VA. And that same thing can be seen up at the top on the parallel artery and vein image when we look at our innominent vein and our aorta and do those same measurements as well. Okay, so we've covered the accelerated conduction and the re-entry tachycardias. Now we're just gonna briefly touch on the abnormal rhythm generation. These types of tachycardias have a gradual onset and offset, so they need a warm up and a cool down period which is different than what we've seen in the re-entry tachycardias um, discussed just a moment ago. So just to look at these, basically in all of these um, abnormal rhythm generation tachycardias, there is an ectopic automatic focus within the heart. And what differentiates them is where that focus is. If it's located in the atria, we have atrial ectopic tachycardia. If it's located at the AV junction, we have junctional ectopic tachycardia. And if it's located in the ventricles, we have ventricular ectopic tachycardia. In our atrial ectopic tachycardia, mostly we have one-to-one -one conduction, but we can have more atrial contractions than ventricular contractions. And the AV interval is typically dependent on the actual placement of the ectopic automatic focus within the atria. With our junctional ectopic tachycardia, again, mostly one-to-one, -one, but this one is variable, and it can have more atrial contractions or more ventricular contractions. What makes this one a little bit unique is that the atria and ventricles most often will contract at the same time because that signal um, from the ectopic automatic focus is being sent out in both directions at the same time. In ventricular ectopic tachycardia, most of the time you have more ventricular contractions than atrial contractions, and there is normally a complete dissociation between the atria and the ventricles, or sometimes you can have retrograde 
one-to-one -one conduction with the ventricles contracting first before the atria. So the take home message for all of this information is not that it needs to be memorized. The important thing to know is that if you're able to measure the intervals that we talked about, the atrial rate, the ventricular rate, and then the AV interval and VA interval, you can get all the information which will then help our doctors try to um, decide which diagnosis or, or category this fetus most likely falls into. And just to quickly touch on the transplacental therapy, of course this lecture is more focused on the ultrasound assessment, so this is just a brief overview. Um, the management is going to differ depending on the institution and the doctors and what they're comfortable with for these different medications. Typically the first line of defense is digoxin, and of course anytime uh, mother is started on any of these medications, they will need close monitoring of maternal serum levels and typically weekly maternal EKGs as well. You do also have other medications um, which can be used for management of these fetal arrhythmias as well. And again, um, for ultrasound, I think the take-home message is that different diagnoses do respond better to different medications or different combinations of medications. So giving as much information as we can to help steer the diagnosis can help the prenatal management plan to be more effective. And that's really the take home message here. Okay, so now we have covered ectopic rhythms in part one. We just covered our tachyarrhythmias and now we're gonna talk about bradyarrhythmias. So in this category, we have heart block, we have sustained atrial bigeminy, and we have a long QT syndrome. And bradyarrhythmias are rather uncommon. They make up about 3% of all fetal arrhythmias. So as we talked about a little bit in part one, um, the definition of bradycardia is less than 110 beats per minute, or we have recently started using less than third percentile for gestational age because that may be more sensitive in picking up some of these bradyarrhythmias. Bradycardia can either be, can be persistent, and if it is, um, it may also cause heart failure and high drops, and lower ventricular rates are more likely to cause fetal high drops. With sinus bradycardia, again, the definition there is the same, less than 110 beats per minute or less than third percentile. It's sustained, and again, the mechanism here for sinus bradycardia is electrical impulses moving through normal conduction pathway, but just at a decreased rate. So still the one-to-one -one conduction and still the normal relationship of the shorter AV interval than VA interval. And this can be associated with heterotaxy syndrome, viral infections, SS, maternal SSA, SSB antibodies, genetic variants, maternal medications, and long QT syndrome. Heart block is defined as the absence of normal electrical communication between the atria and ventricles and it can be caused by disease of the AV node or morphological abnormality of the conduction system, and there are varying degrees. The causes of AV block or heart block, um, most often it is isolated meaning that it is not seen with a congenital heart defect. This happens more than 50% of AV block cases, and it's due to progressive inflammation and fibrosis of the AV node. Most often this is caused by maternal SSA and SSB antibodies, but can also be caused by viral myocarditis, long QT syndrome, or other inherited cardiac conduction disorders.
40% of AV block cases are seen with a congenital heart defect. And again, that causes morphological abnormality of the conduction system. Left atrial isomerism, where you have two left atria and the fetus lacks a normal SA node. So AV block in these cases can be seen early and can be progressive. And complete block is common with a very high risk of intrauterine fetal demise. In congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries, inversion of the ventricles disrupts the normal conduction pathway. Usually AV block in these cases does not appear until the third trimester. And complete block is only seen in about 2% of the cases with congenitally corrected TGA. Between these two types of anomalies, it accounts for greater than 95% of cases with a congenital heart defect that also have AV block. It's rare, but other congenital heart defects can also have AV block as well. So now to discuss the different degrees of AV block. I think the easiest way to kind of break this down is to say how many of the beats are actually conducted through to the ventricles. You have all of the beats conducted. You have first degree block. So the atrial impulse is delayed, but there is still one-to-one -one conduction. If some of the beats are conducted, you have second degree block. And there are two types of second degree block. In type 1, the AV interval gets longer and longer until eventually a beat is not transmitted to the ventricles. And in type 2 block, you get every other beat is conducted to the ventricles, so you get 2 to 1 conduction. And if none of the beats are conducted to the ventricles and the atria and the ventricles are completely dissociated, you have third degree block or complete AV block. So we will look at this. So in first degree AV block, the impulse from the atria to the ventricle is delayed. And you still have one-to-one -one conduction. If you look down at the bottom end mode image, you can clearly see that there's still one-to-one -one conduction. And on this measurement of the inflow outflow image, you can see that the AV interval is measuring greater than 170 milliseconds, which is indicative of a delayed conduction. In this clip here, we have a fetus at 18 weeks that presented with echogenic myocardium, which is suggesting endocardial fibroelastosis. And you can see here that the heart rate appears slower than normal. This is the same fetus seen um, in this example as the umbilical artery up in the top right hand corner. The overall heart rate did measure 120 beats per minute. So at 18 weeks, third percentile should be about 140 beats per minute. So actually in this case, Using the criteria of under third percentile um, for bradycardia and seeing the echogenic myocardium, this is the situation in which we um, had a mother that did not have a previous diagnosis of lupus, but when we tested SSA, SSB antibodies, we actually were able to diagnose maternal lupus as well in this situation and then manage the baby in order to try to stop progression of the AV block. In second degree AV block type 1, again as we said, the AV interval gets longer and longer so the electrical signal is taking longer and longer to go through the AV node to the ventricles and eventually it does not actually get through the AV node and to the ventricles. You can see that here in our inflow outflow image, this first AV interval followed by the second AV interval and the second AV interval is longer. And then in the next 
portion, we have a missing ventricular contraction. You can see that same thing up here in the M mode image at the top. So the atrial contractions are seen by those white arrows at the top. And you can see they are, um, the atria are contracting at a regular rate. And you have a missing ventricular contraction here and also over here on this M mode image. Second degree AV block type two is our two to one conduction where every other impulse is conducted. And here's a clip showing an example of second degree AV block type two. Here on this M mode image, I just wanna point out that you can clearly see this um, red line is cutting through the ventricles, the green line cutting through the atria. So up here at the top, we have our ventricular contractions. The arrows pointing to each ventricular contraction. And at the bottom, we have our atrial contractions. And again, it's just color coded so that you can clearly see there are two atrial contractions to every one ventricular contraction. If we look at our inflow outflow image here, you can see the atrial contraction clearly followed by a ventricular contraction. And then the next atrial contraction, which is not followed by a ventricular contraction. And if we measure our AV interval here on the conducted beats, from the beginning of atrial contraction to the beginning of ventricular contraction, and again, I'm gonna do that on the next cycle that is conducted, we see these AV intervals from the conducted beats are the same. So you can see that the atria here are beating at a regular rate. And now we just want to go back to um, comparing this to blocked atrial by Gemini. So when you have second degree AV block and you have two to one conduction, we want to talk about how to distinguish this from bigeminy, which also has a two to one conduction. So in AV block, the atrial contractions will happen, as I mentioned briefly, at a regular rate of speed, which is different than in bigeminy. So for example, this top image here is a fetus with atrial bigeminy, um, and you have the atrial rate is variable. So from the sinus beat to the PAC is shorter, and from the PAC to the sinus beat is longer. So you can see the time interval alternates there in atrial bigeminy. And in this example of second degree type two AV block, we have a regular or stable atrial rate by comparison. And you can see that the ventricles are showing significant non-compaction as well. Let's play that one one more time. Again, left atrial isomerism with complete AV block. To look at the M mode images a little bit more closely here, measuring the atrial rate and the ventricular rate here you can see that there is no immediate suggestion of um, communication between the atria and ventricles with an atrial rate of 158 and a ventricular rate of 50 this makes you um, concerned about complete av block just by looking at the atrial and ventricular rates but if we look at this M mode image down at the bottom, we can also do some measurements with our AV interval to prove that this is a complete block. So you can see the atria um, are, you can see that they're beating at a regular rate and the ventricular rate is also looks regular there, but they do not have an association and when we put the calipers on to measure the AV intervals, we can prove that as well. So I like to start by placing the first caliper at the beginning of one of the ventricular contractions. 
and then measuring backwards to the prior atrial contraction. This is just the way that I found is easiest to measure these AV intervals in complete blocks. So here's the previous atrial contraction. So this is one of the AV intervals here. And we want to compare that to um, another time within the cardiac cycle. So I'm going to do that same thing for uh, another one of the ventricular contractions. I'm going to pick this one just prior and I'm going to place my caliper at the beginning of that ventricular contraction and measure, measure backwards to the beginning of the previous atrial contraction. And you can see how different these AV intervals are and that is indicative of complete block. And you can see um, in comparison what we pointed out before that in second degree block those conducted AV intervals should be um, about the same. Okay, so now looking at Doppler assessment of third degree AV block. Again, here um, on the aorta and azagous vein, parallel artery and vein image, the little white hands pointing to the atrial contractions there, and you can clearly see the ventricular contraction as well. You can also see this on our inflow outflow image just below that. And here um, on this pulmonary artery and vein in this fetus, this to me was the clearest image to measure these AV intervals, just like we did on the M mode. So I picked to measure on this one here, this AV interval, and then the prior AV interval, which as you can see again, are significantly different. So AV block management and prognosis. Weekly PR intervals are done uh, starting at 16 weeks for all mothers who are SSA, SSB positive in the hopes of picking up heart block before it progresses to complete heart block. And then for treatment, dexamethasone is typically used. And this is a steroid that blocks the inflammatory response to maternal antibodies and may halt disease progression. Typically, it is not very effective for complete block, which is again why we start looking at those weekly PR intervals or as we've talked about in this lecture, AV interval um, starting at 16 weeks so that we do not get to the point of complete block and treatment can be more um, productive. Sometimes intravenous immune globulin will be used with dexamethasone in order to stabilize or reduce maternal antibodies and sometimes can help decrease cardiomyopathy and high drops. Um, and really sometimes the best management plan is delivery. So using these medications um, can help us to get to a viable gestational age for delivery. As far as prognosis, the risk factors for a poor prognosis, presence of congenital heart defect, especially left atrial isomerism, onset before 20 weeks gestation, a ventricular rate under 50 beats per minute, or impaired left ventricular function. Okay, some other reasons that a fetus may have bradycardia are inherited channelopathies. And this is a group of inheritable disorders that predisposes a fetus to arrhythmias through altering the ion channels of the myocardial cells. So the ion channels allow certain ions into and out of the cardiac cells. And this is actually what allows the heart cells to create and conduct impulses. So in this lecture, we're just gonna talk about long QT syndrome. These other channelopathies listed here, short QT or congenital sick sinus, have been reported in prenatal life, in fetal life. However, they are incredibly rare, so much so that um, really just some case studies have been reported. There are other channelopathies, but those ones have not been reported in fetal life. But again, we're going to focus just on long QT as far as channelopathies and in our Brady arrhythmia lecture. So long QT syndrome is the most common inherited channelopathy. 
it is a single gene variant in one of the genes that encodes for the cardiac ion channels, and it causes prolonged ventricular repolarization or an elongated T wave. So you can see the normal EKG up in the top left um, compared to an EKG on a person with long QT syndrome, and that QT interval is prolonged. I just want to point out it's an autosomal dominant inheritance, so family and medical history are extremely important when assessing for long QT syndrome. So things like sudden death within the family, unexplained episodes of fainting or drowning, known family history of long QT syndrome, or history of multiple miscarriages can give us some clues or make us suspicious of long QT. So long QT syndrome has variable presentation in fetal life, and the most common presentation is fetal heart rate less than third percentile. So this is another example of why this definition, less than third percentile for gestational age, is more sensitive when talking about bradyarrhythmias. This graph here is from a study done looking at fetuses with long QT syndrome. And they did a great job pointing out that if we use the criteria of under 110 beats per minute, it only picked up of just under 20% of fetuses with long QT. Whereas if we use the criteria of under third percentile for gestational age, it picked up just over 65% of fetuses with long QT syndrome. Okay, I did just a little kind of overview as of a couple case studies that we've seen at University of Maryland. This um, clip is from a fetus with a heart rate that remained 110 to 120 beats per minute throughout the pregnancy. Mom was known to have long QT syndrome and they had a prior child that also had long QT and she had a history of two miscarriages as well. Second degree type two heart block can also be seen with long QT syndrome, and that is because the ventricles have not fully repolarized by the time the next impulse comes from the atria, so that is what's actually causing the every other conduction of the atria to the ventricles. And this, um, clip here is an example from a fetus that was diagnosed with long QT syndrome. This fetus presented at 18 weeks with 2 to 1 block that was sustained throughout the pregnancy. Of course, our first line of defense was to look at SSA, SSB antibodies, which were negative. And she actually had no known family history of long QT syndrome. So this was a great example of how diagnosing in the fetus was then able to help the rest of the family um, to be able to the presentation today. And um, we look forward to providing more in the future. Thank you. Have a great day.